I'm going to talk to you about our current ESRC-funded study, Locating and Building Trust in High Security Prisons. Um, this project is very much a team effort, and all the team, plus the additional four who've assisted us with the MQPL Plus exercises in each of the three main sites, are present and eager to chat with you. Uh, we have five more weeks of field work to do in Franklin. We were in Franklin yesterday, and it feels like every day we spend there is a, a kind of um, revelation. Um, so uh, five more weeks before we complete what has been a 14-month period in the field, we have some really interesting emerging findings, which um, we'd like to share with you today. Obviously, we've still got a lot of thinking and analysis to do, so our thoughts are a bit tentative. But as we usually do, this is, this is a high-risk day. We don't <coughs> present totally completed and published research to you, but we, we present up to this morning's analysis. Um, so you're getting it very uh, cutting edge. Now, this is the title of the book that we plan to write. Uh, the observant among you will notice that it has a certain resonance with a classic work... Um, here's the classic work, Prisons and the Problem of Order. And it's not an accident that we want to call our book Prisons and the Problem of Trust. So Richard Sparks, Tony Bottoms and Will Hay studied two contrasting high security prisons very closely in the late 1980s, one of which happened to be Long Latin, which is fantastic because Long Latin's in our study now. Um, they described two very different models of order attracting quite different degrees of assent among prisoners and giving rise to very distinct challenges and risks. And our, our project is arguing and finding that forms of order and degrees or varieties of trust are closely related. So one of our headline findings is that we've also found very different forms of order in each of the prisons in the study. And this is despite the fact that there's now a high security estate that looks at least on um, management sort of style, they look as if they should be much more like each other. Um, they're completely not. So we found very different forms of order in each of the prisons. So different types of relationships, different approaches to the rules, a different mood and ethos, and different chances of progression out or off Cat A. An increasingly important aspect of the form of order found relates to the treatment of or attitudes towards race or ethnicity and religion in each prison. So population composition is part of this storyline, but there are other factors too, relating to the history, geography and culture and management of each prison. And the important role played by members of chaplaincy teams, for example, uh, offender management units, diversity and equality leads or reps, and so on. So the formal title of our project is Locating Trust in a Climate of Fear, Religion, Moral Status, Prisoner Leadership and Risk in Maximum Security Prisons. It's funded by the ESRC's Transforming Social Science Scheme, which is a highly competitive scheme intended to support groundbreaking high-risk research. Ours was the only proposal to be um, from Cambridge University to make it through to the final round. And amazingly, um, there's been a second round of the scheme, and again, a colleague from the Institute of Criminology has been the only person to go through from Cambridge University and win a grant. So we're doing something right. Um, the study is pursuing a series of complex developments to have taken place in high security prisons over a number of years, including the changing role of faith identities a transformed prisoner hierarchy, and apparently increased risks of radicalisation and extremism among prisoners. There's much more going on than trust here, as I shall try and explain. So how did we come to focus on these themes, and why have we placed trust of all concepts at the heart of a project in such an unlikely place? So um, the answer is cumulative. Our understanding of the dynamics of trust draws on three separate studies carried out between 1998 and the present. They were all conceived and funded in very different ways. So the first, on staff-prisoner relationships at Whitemore, was very loosely conceived and funded, very lightly funded. The second was conducted under intense political concern 12 years later about the risks of extremism and radicalisation in prison. 
But we uh, attempted to resist these categories by offering to repeat the first study of staff-prisoner relationships under more formal and generous funding arrangements. And then the third is the ESRC, so independently funded study I've just introduced. So if we go back to the first Whitehall study, which took place in 1998, um, this study predates MQPL, but it sort of led to it. It was the beginning, um, Trevor's here somewhere, and uh, was the governor at the time, um, it sort of led to MQPL in the sense that uh, we were focusing in that study on trying to conceptualise and describe the complex work that prison officers were doing. Um, so the use of power and discretion through relationships. One of the ingredients of relationships was trust, so a sort of credit is built up between staff and prisoners which oils the flow of prison life. We wrote about this in the first Whitemore study, but we certainly didn't measure it. We haven't got anywhere near that stage. We knew it was there, and we knew and said that a guarded form of trust was doing some work. It was doing some work in relation to legitimacy and order, although we didn't use, we weren't quite using the language of legitimacy at that stage either. What matters here is that by time two in Whitemore, trust had all but disappeared with quite serious consequences for staff and prisoners. So we described the prison, when we returned to it 12 years later, as paralysed by distrust. And the painfulness of observing and describing that transformation became, for me, um, unfinished business. The explanation for that decline was the combined effects of a post-9-11 climate, the imprisonment of offenders convicted of offences against the Terrorism Act, changes to sentencing and to the population being sentenced, and a new penological approach to prison management, which created distance between managers and the wings. <coughs> of course, one of the difficulties with trust in a prison setting is that there can be too much as well. As we saw in Doncaster Prison in the first Measuring the Quality of Prison Life study in 2001. So this is the problem of trust. Um, there can be too little and there can be too much. It arises most acutely in high security prisons. It has to be intelligently placed. So we applied for funding to carry out a tightly designed study exploring the relationship between moral and organisational aspects of a prison's environment, including levels of intelligent trust, and political charge or anger and alienation among prisoners in the high security estate. I'll explain the rationale for this precise framing of the question in a minute. So our overall analysis has both a longitudinal and cross-sectional component, and we've now got four of the five uh, prisons in the high security estate captured if we include data from the return project to Whitemore in 2009-10 um, for analytic purposes. So the longitudinal nature of the inquiry is quite important, um, even though it's accidental. It's taken three detailed studies to work out what the right question is, to assemble the right team, and to develop the right methodology for the task. So in some ways, this is we're, we're advocating cumulative repeat studies because it takes such a long time to, to focus in precisely the right place. So based on the findings of the second Whitemore study, we're now exploring some formal hypotheses in this project, among many other things. Um, We've used, uh, we ended the second Whitemore project with reference to Honora O'Neill's concept of intelligent trust. As she put it, failing to trust the trustworthy is very costly, uh, not just in financial terms, but also in terms of outcomes, that it can have very negative effects if we fail to trust people who might be trustworthy. So our version of her question is how can prison staff and senior managers the authorities, or any of us, place trust intelligently in a climate of fear and risk. So here are our three main hypotheses. First, that some intelligent trust generates constructive faith exploration and identities or spiritual capital and lowers risk. Secondly, that failed state prisons, prisons that are paralysed by distrust, generate more political charge and therefore more dangerous faith identities. 
Thirdly, that different types of prisoners are esteemed or rise to the top of the prisoner hierarchy, carrying influence in these different kinds of climates. So these hypotheses are derived from three sources, the Whitemore II study, an American study by Mark Hamm, and our general reading of prison sociology, which has always described prisoner hierarchies, but which generally neglects the important and increasing role of faith in status or meaning-making in prison. When we talk about spiritual capital, we're not confining this to religious belief, but it refers to the fundamentally human need for moral purpose and value. So I'll just briefly outline the key messages from the first two of these sources. So in the Whitemore II study, we found in the language of our recently published article on this theme that the prison had changed in 12 years from somewhat heavy present to heavy absent. That This is describing staff orientation towards prisoners. So staff had moved away from prisoners and their orientation towards them was more about security and control than about personal development or humanity. There'd been a kind of narrowing or misrecognition of the changing prisoner community, which was significantly more black and mixed race. So if you can work on the figures, the prison had changed, the population had changed in 12 years from 21% to 55% of the uh, population being black and minority uh, groups. It was also substantially more Muslim, so the population in the prison when we returned to it in 2009 was 40% Muslim prisoners, half of whom were in prison conversions. In the terms of Martin Buber, the prison staff had shifted from I-thou to I-it relations with prisoners. That is, prisoners were regarded as experienced objects rather than experiencing subjects. The role of the chaplaincy had diminished at a time when faith identities were becoming significant shapers of the flow of power in the prison. So Whitemore too had the characteristics both of a new penological but also a failed state prison by the time we returned to it 12 years later, including a relative absence of management presence, officer alienation and retreat from prisoners, and for prisoners, a lack of purpose, safety, fairness, or opportunities for growth and meaning. There were new and unexplored moral and religious challenges in the prison, high levels of fear and distance, and a new mood that regarded talk and relationships as dangerous. But that was the most the, the profound transformation, um, was that in our first study, the, we had a conference, Trevor held a conference on staff-prisoner relationships, and relationships were definitely regarded as oil. Um, during the second study, um, staff were taken on one side and given a bit of a security intelligence talking to if they were seen spending too long talking to prisoners individually. This was a really dramatic transformation. So the prison was more difficult to penetrate for us as researchers and power was being fought over by prisoners, some of whom were converting to Islam because it was both appealing and poorly understood and therefore its practices were difficult to police. So the outcomes of this apparent decline in staff recognition or knowledge about their population and in guarded or intelligent trust, as well as the discourse about the role of relationships in high security prisons were not good. Relationships were no longer oil, but they were a risk. Prisoners were in conflict with each other, staff were less professionally confident, and prisoners were angry as well as self-censoring. Religious identity became a source of power as well as an avenue of meaning. Some black prisoners were organized, oppositional, and some were disrupting traditional hierarchies, exerting status and identity by imposing rules, for example, relating to the cooking of food in kitchens, or, um, and they were doing this, for example, in the name of prison Islam, in inverted commas, by which we mean a form of norm-regulating behavior, which is sometimes violent, and exercised with reference to a righteous form of Islam. We collectively wrote this sentence on the train on the way home from Franklin yesterday. Um, so acts of violence in the prison were uh, relatively frequent and were constructed as religious disputes. 
mature white professional gangsters stood back on the wings, describing, in inverted commas, moral decay, by which they meant the eclipse of ordinary decent criminal values in prison. <laughs> ordinary Muslim prisoners were uncomfortable and also heavily scrutinised. Some aspects of what Mark Ham has called the remaking of black manhood in prison were being imported uh, from the streets. Whatever the causes, the key message from this return study was that empirical differences in levels of trust in prison have major consequences for life in those prisons. We left the prison concerned that some aspects of the management of the prison and the treatment of prisoners might actually be contributing to the risk of violence or extremism rather than reducing either. There were certainly risks that overreactive security reporting could alienate those prisoners who were more knowledgeable and pro-social about Islam or who were peacekeepers on the wings. Now, because it wasn't designed, it wasn't designed into these two studies to be longitudinal, some of our grasp of precisely what had changed and why was speculative. It had been quite difficult to reach some of the more influential leaders in the prison the second time around, as well as to talk meaning, meaningfully about distinctions between varieties of Islam with prisoners. So we needed to move from longitudinal thinking to cross-sectional exploration. Was it possible to find high security prisons above the low trust threshold and then see whether things were different? Was it possible to grow trust back or um, place trust more intelligently? And if so, with whom and how? So um, the second source of our framework is Mark Ham's US study, um, The Spectacular Few, which was published after we'd completed the second Whitemore study. He suggested, based on his research, that Islam in prison poses a security threat only under certain conditions of confinement in mismanaged, understaffed, or overcrowded maximum security prisons where offenders can become radicalized through a process of one-on-one -on -one proselytizing by charismatic leaders. Otherwise, he finds, Islam has a moderating effect on prisoners um, which plays an important role in prison security and rehabilitation. He refers really briefly to the failed state prisons, a concept of the failed state prisons, and he argues that they generate more political charge on the wings and in the uh, uh, areas, the exercise yards. So what he referred to briefly as failed state prisons generate more political charge or anger and alienation on the prison yards and landings. And it's in these settings, he found, that radicalised prisoner cells have grown. This is according to his quite extensive interviews with <coughs> convicted terrorists, in-prison converts and imams. In less politically charged environments, prisoners, as well as chaplains, may do uh, a, cons a considerable amount of constructive theological work countering violent interpretations of Islam. One aspect of his argument that jumped out at us was this sentence, the second sentence here, that one key characteristic of the failed state is its failure to live up to its moral obligation to provide transgressors with the opportunity to pursue their reformation. This was powerful because one of the major changes we found between Whitemore 1 and Whitemore 2 was the reduction in opportunities for prisoners to pursue personal development in general or to come off high risk and high-risk registers in particular, or to uh, pursue or even evidence their own reformation. So we wondered whether this concept of political charge might work like distress works in our studies of suicides in prison, acting as a warning signal or barometer of risk. So in the suicide studies, we know that safer, more relational and caring prisons could both generate less distress as well as manage the distress they generated in more constructive ways, and that that led to lower institutional suicide rates. So we're thinking about the concept of political charge in the same way. Um, forgive the amount of information on this slide. and Stay in the middle. I was attracted to this concept of the failed state prison because it provides a language for thinking about the outcomes uh, or the, uh, the outcomes of gains and losses in legitimacy, as well as making us think about some of the explanations. So it might take the legitimacy framework further. 
So theorists of political violence outside the prison are identifying factors like perceptions of powerlessness and discrimination, religious and intergroup conflict, power and leadership struggles, population change, disorganisation, and so on, that make sense in or can be adapted to the prison environment. So the concept of political charge, if we redrew this figure in the light of what I'm about to say, we take political charge out of here and put it here, suggesting that all of these things, both distal and proximate causes, uh, increase or decrease levels of political charge and that then they have, they lead to higher levels of political charge, lead to a combination of undesirable outcomes. So we think the concept of political charge might be an intermediate variable in the same way that distress was in our suicide studies. Welcome. So um, this is it. So for all sorts of good theoretical and methodological reasons, we're attempting to measure political charge or prisoner anger and alienation and to see whether it's being generated to different degrees by different high-security prison climates. So these are the items in the new dimension. The shame and acceptance items are taken from the defiance literature, which suggests that they're inhibited by feelings of illegitimacy, the others have been developed from conversations with prisoners, uh, our interview transcripts from both studies, and a workshop we had with Suzanne Carstet, who works in this field. And it has reasonably high reliability so far. So uh, this is what we're doing. Following conversations, we, chose, we, were, we were asking for prisons, high security prisons that might be just slightly above the trust threshold, and following conversations with many uh, people who knew, we chose Full Sutton, which is in York, and Franklin, which is in Durham, for the research. Two prisons up north, um, but very, very different norths. So overall, this is a qualitative study. So it's involved deep immersion by all four of us in all aspects of each prison's life. We're taking faith identities and religious observance as objects of inquiry rather than as indicators of risk, and we're subjecting all organisational categories, so Muslim, uh, minority ethnic, ideology, dangerousness, progress, etc., to investigation and critique. So we're trying to answer the questions, what does in-prison conversion to Islam mean? Under what circumstances does it occur? When is a conversation about religion theological rather than radicalizing. More generally, how do people find themselves in high security prisons? Who's there? Uh, how do they find themselves on internal high risk procedures? And how are these practices linked to perceptions of the fairness of authorities? So using methods developed specially for this study, we're trying to integrate the role of religion, faith, personal ideology, and moral status as well as the usual questions of order and legitimacy into prison sociology via trust. We've included some innovative methods drawn from research on religious communities, for example, some techniques for studying leadership and resilience to violent extremism based on social network analysis. And this is in addition to all our usual methods of dialogue, appreciative inquiry, and a revised version of the MQPL survey. So basically, we want to know what's going on in each prison from the perspective of staff and all reachable prisoners. In an accident of enthusiasm, and this was both our enthusiasm and the um, NOMS organisation, we were invited to carry out an MQPL plus exercise in Long Latin between the fieldwork in Full Sutton and Franklin. So we used the revised version of the questionnaire when we did so. And that means we've got data from three prisons. Um, obviously the qualitative data, we have some, but it's a bit more limited from Long Latin. So, um, I think I've got, um, I thought I'd replaced these slides with some that were a bit more readable, but I might have put them somewhere else. <laughs> uh, we'll see what happens. If you can make sense of them on this figure, um, what it's telling you is that um, the hypotheses are supported. I'll explain why we can say that in a minute. The most important finding, if you look at 
Full Sutton, Long Martin and Franklin. In this figure, Franklin hasn't got its colour codes yet, but if you can see the figures, and I take you to political charge, which is our new dimension that we're most interested in, here's the political charge figure at Full Sutton, here's the one at Long Martin, and here's the one at Franklin. Um, and what they show you is that political charge varies significantly by establishment. These are significant differences, they're very large, and they're in the direction that we would expect, knowing everything that we know about the prisons. Um, I'll say more about those results in a minute. But it's also significant that these differences coincide with differences in levels of intelligent trust, humanity, bureaucratic legitimacy, and the quality of relationships in the prison. So... As it happens, Full Sutton looks a bit like Whitemore 2. So we've got MQPL results from Whitemore 2, and they look like they belong together. So that is relatively low scores on harmony and professionalism dimensions and higher scores on security dimensions. Long Latin and Full Sutton, if we start to think about these prisons along a continuum now, with Full Sutton and Whitemore at this end and Long Latin and Franklin at this end, they feel and score very differently. Having a lighter uh, and more individualised climate and significantly higher scores on harmony, including care dimensions. So if we include Whitemore too in our thinking, the prisons seem to fall into two general categories. What we might call the new penological, so that's Full Sutton and Whitemore too, characterised by vigilant security the meeting of targets, proactive rule following, and a form of professionalism that relates mainly to risk management. That's category one. Category two, we're calling old penological or old school. This is Long Latin and Franklin. And these prisons are characterised by a different form of professionalism relating to the development or progress of prisoners and higher levels of engagement with prisoners. Staff in these prisons have narratives about prisoners. They use a lot of discretion, they carry risk, or they manage risk through trust. So prisoners in Full Sutton say, you feel like a statistic, whereas prisoners in Franklin say, you feel like a person. Obviously, the composition and geographical location of each prison is distinctive, and this impacts on the orientation of staff and their perceived levels of power and control. What's really uh, striking is that the four prisons each operate to a distinct underlying model or form of order which lies along a continuum with different underlying constructions of dangerousness. So from directed at Full Sutton, people know where dangerousness lies and proactively seek and manage it, to diffuse at Franklin, at the other end of the spectrum, where there are fewer preconceptions about where dangerousness might lie. So these underlying constructions also apply to their different approaches to security and control, different modes of social control. So um, we, we knew that there was something special going on at Franklin. We didn't exactly save it till the end, but we're really pleased that we did save it to the end because we had some high hopes about it and um, we found those hopes have almost been exceeded in a way by some aspects of what we've seen there. So um, the mode of social control at Franklin is dialogue. So even adjudications, and I don't think the staff there know enough about us, it's a long way away, to be doing this for our benefit. Even adjudications at Franklin seem to be used to build relationships between staff and prisoners. Um, each of the prisons seems to have a different underlying purpose, and of course all of this is shaping the prisoner experience. So one tentative conclusion so far is that becoming paralysed by distrust is not inevitable. It's an inherent risk in the new management model, and it's an inherent risk in an emotional climate of fear. Where intelligent trust grows, risk is managed more effectively. So in the way that Sykes said you have to lose control in order to gain control, we're saying you have to trust in order to manage risk. But these are the headlines. There are some complexities in the data once we start to disentangle 
race and religion in each. So if we take intelligent trust to begin with, this is another new dimension, and we look at it a bit more closely, there's clearly something very different going on between staff and prisoners uh, or the system and prisoners in each prison. So the dimension means for intelligent trust are significantly different. So these are the means. Um, Full Sutton, 2.57, which is a low score. 2.71, which is still a medium-low score. And 2.91, which for those of you who know the MQPL rules, is close to 3, which means it's not a positive score, but it's significantly better than this one, which is significantly better than this one. These are the reliabilities. So there's a pattern to prisoners' responses to our items about intelligent trust. If we look at the two items, I feel recognised as the person I am in this prison, and I have opportunities to show I'm trustworthy in this prison, the scores are highly informative. Prisoners feel unrecognised at Full Sutton, less so at Long Larton, but much less so at Franklin which shows a just over neutral score of 3.02. There are, according to prisoners, significantly more opportunities to show I can be trustworthy at Long Larton, and again significantly so at Franklin. None of the scores are high, but these are substantial differences, and we're arguing that these differences really matter. The same striking pattern arises for political charge, and we're currently trying to think through the question of what these scores mean in practice and how political charge works. So Full Sutton, Long Larton and Franklin each have a significantly different overall mean score with a step change between them from a low 2.61 at Full Sutton to a significantly higher 2.72 at Long Larton to an almost neutral 2.95 2.95 at Franklin. We felt these differences, so Full Sutton had a more charged atmosphere, Long Larton felt much lighter, and at Franklin, despite vigilant security over movements, uh, for example, prisoners are less tense, they talk about being treated as a person, and they engage with staff. The almost neutral score at Franklin doesn't mean that we didn't find anger and alienation. So there's still a significant number of prisoners agreeing with the angry statements at Franklin. So just in case I'm giving the impression that everything's rosy at Franklin, um, there's still 31% of prisoners who agree or strongly agree that my time in prison has made me angry compared to 46% at Full Sutton. So 31 at Franklin, which we're saying feels fundamentally different, 46% at Full Sutton. So these are substantial but not complete differences. But it's very interesting that white prisoners generally report lower levels of political charge, that is higher scores, except at Long Larton, where black prisoners report less. And if you can go with the flow of these figures, that's the only prison where black prisoners report less political charge than white prisoners. Um, It's also the case that when prisoners talk to us, they tell us that Long Larton is a good prison to be a black prisoner. So um, the differences between... uh, Sorry, I've lost myself here. Um, Yeah, It's very interesting that white prisoners generally report lower levels of political charge, whereas black prisoners report less at Long Larton. In all three prisons, Muslim prisoners report higher levels of political charge, but the differences between other prisoners in each prison and the experience of Muslim prisoners vary significantly. So uh, it was made very clear to us in interviews that being black in Long Latin was less of an added problem than being Muslim in Long Latin or being either black or Muslim in Full Sutton. Being Muslim is, is associated with higher political charge in Full Sutton than in Franklin. So in other words, these are these are figures to think with, we're interested in these differences, but we're also interested in these differences. These are all the same type of prison, doing the same type of thing, but this is the amount of political charge in our Muslim sample in Franklin, and it's very significantly less political charge, a higher score, than this figure for Full Sutton, which is, we're suggesting, reaching a bit of a tipping point. 
So Larry Sherman, some of you may know him, he's the director of our institute, uh, he suggested to us that not all of our dimensions are linear, that some may have tipping points at which major events might arise or major changes in the climate can be felt. Um, apparently there are statistical techniques to test this theory, so um, Catherine and Larry are talking about how this might be possible with our data at the moment. The, the sort of way we might think about this is how much support might there be on a wing among prisoners, for example, for a hostage taking. So above a certain tipping point, it only takes one well-disposed prisoner to tip off the staff. Below this tipping point, it might be less likely. So we're not trying to say there's no political charge here and there's tons of it here, and it's very differently distributed around the wings. We're trying to say above a certain threshold, things get much better, and below a certain threshold, things get much worse. So this is speculative, but we're exploring forms of analysis as well as our interview data that might help us say a bit more. The results look more complex by wing, so I'll come to that in a moment. But one of the things we were talking about yesterday on the train on our way home is that at Franklin, in a somewhat less charged atmosphere, expressing normal religious doubt is permissible, for example. Prisoners invite each other to religious celebrations. Interfaith dialogue is normalised, and this is much less the case in the other two prisons. So, uh, we're still exploring the data, but here's a first path analysis for Franklin. We expect the model to look similar for all three prisons, and we'll eventually conduct analyses that control for ethnicity, religion, and prison. Higher scores on, these are the sort of dimensions that seem to be doing most of the work. So higher scores on bureaucratic legitimacy, which is um, the transparency and legitimacy of the sentence management process. The sort of, how do I get out of here? Um, issues and how does that work? How knowledgeable are staff? How much are they helping me with those sorts of things? So higher scores on that, on staff-prisoner relationships and humanity in particular, lead to higher scores on both trust and intelligent trust, which in turn lead to lower political charge. And these relationships are significant. Um, Catherine, at my request yesterday, uh, this really is last minute, did an analysis of the 24 highest politically charged group of prisoners at Franklin and found that these prisoners had significantly lower scores on almost every dimension. They also had significantly higher mean family contact scores. And we found that two particular wings, two wings and the SEG, F wing, J wing and the SEG, were slightly overrepresented in that uh, group. This high charge group were not significantly more Muslim, but they were slightly uh, more black Caribbean. They were a little bit overrepresented in that group. So, the survey results, this is the, the, the results I've just shown you, but in a slightly more readable form. They suggest that there are significant differences in the character of BME prisoners' experiences in each prison too. And this is uh, consistent with our qualitative data where prisoners often compare their experiences as a Muslim, as a black prisoner, as a scouser, as a Londoner, uh, as an ex-soldier, and so on, in each of the high security prisons they've been to. The differences between uh, black and minority prisoners and non-black and minority prisoners' experiences in each prison are the largest in Full Sutton, particularly in the harmony and professionalism and the new dimensions, and they're smallest in Franklin, although there are some. The findings on um, intelligent trust and political charge are most striking, as black prisoners at Franklin score 2.64 on intelligent trust, compared to 2.26 at Full Sutton. Black prisoners at Franklin score 2.67 on political charge, compared to 2.46 at um, Full Sutton. These are very large differences. There's obviously considerable overlap between being black and being Muslim, but it's really interesting that we're finding important cultural differences in how these categories are regarded and policed in each place. And I think we're agreed as a team that the question of whether cultural and or religious practices are shut down or worked with varies by prison, 
as does the question of who staff go to for help with prisoner dynamics. So we've only seen prison staff at Franklin go to black or Muslim prisoners for help with the dynamics on the wing. In the other two prisons, staff have tended to go to white, organised, professional, uh, sort of um, old-fashioned, old-school uh, prisoners. So whether diversity reps are seen as resources or threats matters in each place. Um, talking through this, I think we're detecting cynical versus tragic orientations among staff. I'm referring to a paper I've written on prison officers here, so it's shorthand, um, but it definitely feels like we're finding very different orientations among staff, out of which distinctive constructions of race and religious identity are being played out. Um, sorry for this. <laughs> Just look at the circles and I'll tell you what's happening. This is the prod for me. This is the wings in Franklin. So if we look within Franklin, it's interesting to note this because we know the prison very well, that F wing has the lowest scores on staff prisoner relationships, humanity, decency, care for the vulnerable, help and assistance, staff professionalism, just with C wing, bureaucratic legitimacy, fairness and organisation and consistency. It also has the lowest scores for uh, uh, well-being, feeling intelligently trusted and political charge. It also has amongst the lowest score for prisoner social life, which is about relationships between prisoners. So we don't want to say everything's rosy at Franklin, um, and the political charge score would be enough to worry us on that wing. On the other hand, Westgate and the pipe which is why we went to Franklin. Westgate is a DSPD unit, and the pipe is a psychologically informed, planned environment, a new thing that's going on in quite a lot of prisons. They have the highest scores of any prison we've measured to date, including Grendon. So until this point, um, we've always had a consensus that Grendon gets the highest scores from prisoners in terms of how prisoners feel treated. Well, we think Westgate and the Pipe, this is a high-security prison, people serving 20, 30-year sentences, and they're prepared to rave about um, the wings that they are experiencing. So the Pipe's personal development score, uh, which is uh, here, 4.15, is the highest we've ever seen, and its political charge score, so on the Pipe, uh, political charge is here, that's 3.62. That's also reassuringly the highest, uh, it's highly positive. So it's 3.62 here compared to 2.47 on a different wing. Uh, and because only 13 of the 164 prisoners to participate in the survey at Franklin were on the Pipe and Westgate, we don't think those two wings explain Franklin. So we're not saying it's only because they've got these two wings that it's all looking different. This is something that's true of the whole prison. So they don't account for Franklin's overall positive scores. These evaluations, though, are striking, and they're consistent with our qualitative observations as well as our theoretical framework. Of course, the population composition on each wing varies, so the highest proportion of black and Muslim prisoners are on F and J wings at Franklin, and we're trying to work on, work up an analysis that treats ethnicity, religion and wing as independent variables, so we can work out how far the highest levels of political charge can be explained by the climate in the prison or by interactions between identity and the climate in the prison. Um, we have all the qualitative data to draw on, so we will have a lot to say about all of this eventually, but you'll be relieved to know not today. So we're working our way towards an empirical theoretical model in which significant, levels in, uh, significant differences in levels of political charge or anger and alienation among prisoners are explained by differences in the nature and quality of staff-prisoner relationships, degrees of intelligent trust, and the perceived legitimacy of the regime, including access to meaningful or progression-oriented activities. Prisoners in these establishments feel more individually known. Um, in this model, recognition of individuality, if not culture, and opportunities to demonstrate trustworthiness matter. We've looked very briefly at the SQL data for each of these prisons, so the staff data, uh, and we found that climates with little or no political charge 
are characterised by a higher quality of life among staff, but especially in recognition efficacy and relationships with senior managers and the governor, rather than by a declared uh, distinct vision of prisoners. So in other words, when we look in the staff data to see what's going on here, what is it about the staff, what, why are they doing this job so differently, the differences are all upwards. So the differences that come out in the SQL data are about how staff feel about the people above them. We're not finding significant differences, declared significant differences, in their view of prisoners, or their, their view about whether prisoners can be rehabilitated, whether they trust them. They're all saying the same thing. We don't think that that means they're not looking at prisoners very differently, because the qualitative data screams differences. So we've got a problem with our SQL data, we don't know whether it's particularly true of high security prisons, but we think it probably isn't, that prison officers declare a view of prisoners, whoever they are and whatever they're doing, and then they do the job completely differently. So we're going to have to use our qualitative data to describe what it is that staff are doing and what they're saying and what prisoners are saying. It comes out in the prisoner data crystal clear, but the staff, staff are more complicated, as you all know. So... Um, those parts of the SQL that ask staff about their vision of prisoners, how far they trust them, do not show up the differences that we're seeing. Uh, we're also hearing about these differences in interviews. So consistent with our early work on prison officer discretion, these differences seem to go on at the level of practical rather than discursive consciousness. Those of you who've read your Giddens or been to do the MST, etc., know what I mean, that this is something that staff can't put into words. And so they say they're all doing it the same way, but actually they're not doing it the same way. It's, it's a fundamentally different vision of prisoners and the job. Explanations for these differences include the performance model adopted by governors and senior managers. So this is my radical moment. Uh, a very good governor at Fundland, he's just left and been replaced by someone who's looking like another quite good governor. Uh, the governor who's left says to his staff, I can tell you because he's now retired, <laughs> Uh, we all know the performance framework matters and that we've got to meet our targets, but I'm telling you it's not the most important thing we do. The most important thing we do is care for each other and care for prisoners. And he says that every day. And so he's a delinquent governor. And we're finding, as you might hear later, that delinquent governors might be running better prisons. <laughs> this is important information. So uh, explanations are... The, perform the particular kind of performance model adopted by governors, the concept of order and diversity understood by staff, and their work with prisoners, by which we mean what they do and not what they say. As for the question of where trust is built and how this might be linked to personal change, it seems to be in the gym. Uh, in education, including literature, music and art <coughs> classes, in certain workshops or horticulture apprenticeships. And uh, sometimes, this is something that a quarter of prisoners agreed with, in something that prison officers are doing. So these staff groups should not be neglected in any vision of rehabilitation. And I think these results very much uh, are in line with what we're witnessing. Uh, we're still investigating the very complex question of progress off Cat A or out of the high security estate. And this obviously constitutes an important part of prisoners' evaluations of each prison. And it's a puzzle to us that Long Latin seems to move more people off Cat A and out more willingly than Franklin has done to date. So we're raving about Franklin, but we can't understand why it never downgrades anyone. Um, now that we've told it, Interestingly, some of the senior managers said to us, oh, we didn't realise. They don't count those figures. So now we've told them they never downgrade anyone. They might start to downgrade a few people. Um, so this is fundamental to prisoners' experience of being in the high security estate, but because it's not on anybody's radar, we're the first people to have pointed out um, major differences between the prisons. So we know there are important changes taking place. So the question here is how and under what circumstances does intelligent trust, which is clearly going on at Long Latin and Franklin, translate into movement through the high security estate? We know there are important changes taking place in this area, including a completely revised CAT-A review system focusing less exclusively on courses, 
and we hope our research presence is making some impact in this respect by just raising questions about the very small numbers and disproportionate profile of prisoners making it out of the very expensive high security estate. So what can we conclude from our analysis so far? Um, it seems to us that political charge is a useful concept, that it works empirically. It might only work until prisoners work out that we're asking it. So there are going to be some problems with this. It's a very political uh, dimension. Um, but for the time being, it works empirically. It might operate as a red flag, uh, along with other dimensions. Since we know that it's linked to low scores on all the other dimensions, we don't need to measure it, actually, once we establish that there is a relationship. Um, it might be a red flag when it reaches certain levels. We think about 2.5 seems to be where things start to look uh, dodgy. But our model isn't deterministic, so there seem to be two possibilities when political charge is high, depending on the dynamics and individuals on each wing. So on some high political charge wings, the type of leadership being described by prisoners involves individuals with high moral integrity. On others, we see these constructive leaders being misperceived as radicalizers. Uh, one distinctive aspect of our work in this project is beginning to understand how the emotions of fear and trust are impacting on the prison environment. So there seems to be some conflict between the new penology, that is trust in systems, and intelligent trust, that is trust in individuals. In a climate of fear and risk, or a low emotional propensity to trust, even instrumental or calculating forms of trust are limited. And this unwillingness to place trust, uh, to, tr to place it intelligently, may backfire. There seems to be some conflict, though, between the old penology, which we're seeing and saying looks good, and the performance framework. So resistant, delinquent, but principled governors may be running better prisons than compliant, performance-oriented governors. Um, what's important, I guess, so far, is that there really are significant differences in quality of life between high-security prisons, as well as uh, in levels of progress, and they're linked to thou relations. Um, that is, whether or not a person is seen as an experiencing subject or an experienced object. Um, these are also explained by differences in the handling of risk, ethnicity, and religion. And this means the role of chaplains, imams, diversity and equality reps, offender management departments, and leadership matter in their own right, as well as in shaping staff orientations more generally. Um, it looks like enabling environments and pipes are very promising in all respects. And finally, um, there are considerable challenges in the legitimate managing, management of a changing prisoner population, some of whom are in serious conflict with each other, that tackling both discrimination and the risk of extremism uh, at the same time is really very tricky. Our argument so far is that even in a high security prison, efforts at recognition and intelligent trust undertaken clear-headedly could improve opportunities for control and order public safety and prisoner rehabilitation. But we're obviously aware that we've got much more work to do completing and analysing our data and exploring our emerging findings further. Um, so I've referred to quite a few different background ideas in this paper, so I've put some references up there. Um, but I also want to just thank the rest of the MQPL Plus team who've worked really hard with us uh, collecting all of this data um, I want to thank Bethany for this slide design, which I love. I think it's really yoga and zen, and it's peaceful and beautiful. So it's, it's going to be, going to be my slide of choice for the time being. Um, Catherine, who I know we're all giving a really hard time asking her for analyses every five minutes in the middle of the night and at five o'clock in the morning. Um, and Julia's helped considerably with this PowerPoint um, slide, uh, with this PowerPoint presentation. I must also acknowledge Tony Bottoms and Suzanne Carstet, who've given us really encouraging.